The following interview is being conducted with Dr. Mary O'Hara for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It's taking place on August 16th, 2019 at her home. The, interview, the interviewer is Katie Watson, the France A. Cordova archivist. Uh, so, Dr. O'Hara, um, first can you tell me a little bit about yourself? So like where were you born? When were you born? Um, who were your parents? Mm -hmm. Um, and like where did you grow up and everything? Okay. Well, I was uh, born in Oak Park, Illinois, January 9th, 1952. And um, I grew up in Cicero, Illinois, and in, the, in Chicago in a, the community of Bridgeport, which is the, the neighborhood where Mayor Daly and all those folks grew up. I grew right up in Chicago politics. My father was his bodyguard at one time, and mm -hmm. so we were right in with the machine later when we moved to, we moved to uh, Chicago. And um, let's see, and then I came to school down here in 1970 to Carbondale, Illinois, and uh, have been down here ever since. Wow, and that was for your undergraduate degree? My undergraduate, yeah. I I had to make do with what kind of resources I had. I did not have any parental support for college or oh, okay. that kind of thing, so I had to piece together my education. Okay. And um, so I was able to get a teacher scholarship here. At the time, if you had a... Um, oh, I think a B average in high school, and said you wanted to be a teacher and committed yourself to being a teacher, you got your tuition paid at the state schools. Oh, awesome. So I took advantage of that, and so I came here, and when I finished up with that, um, didn't feel like going back to Chicago, and one of my teachers offered me the opportunity of uh, working on a master's. Um, and uh, that was in sociology. Didn't finish up with that, but later on, I went back and got a master's in community development here. And then I went on to get the dissertation at SIU in okay. 2004. That's probably one of SIU's longer running graduate students. Oh, okay. <laughs> I did a lot of <laughs> things in between. Yeah. Yeah. And my parents, uh, James O'Hara, uh, born in 1907, uh, was. Uh, from that Bridgeport neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, his parents were Irish immigrants. They came over in 1903 from um, an area in Cross Molina, County Mayo, Ireland. So he was first generation and uh, grew up with the, uh, the packing houses of Chicago. His, his parents, though, had very uh, quaint farms in Mayo, quite an adjustment they must have made to come from the beautiful green rural areas of Ireland into Chicago's meatpacking houses. Yeah, yeah, there was a lot of, there, so there was a lot of tension in um, things with that. Um, and then my mother uh, was from St. Louis, and she found out later in life she was adopted Oh, okay. And I just recently did the research and was able to find out who her adopted parents were. Unfortunately, she wasn't alive for me to be able to tell her, but oh. yeah. That's so. really interesting. Did you end up connecting with them? No, no, okay. they, everybody's gone. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I didn't get a picture of my grandmother, but I was able to get a picture of my grandfather. But the people who adopted her, I consider my grandmother and grandfather, of and they course, were wonderful yeah. people. Wonderful people. That's great. So, yeah. That's beautiful. Um, what made you decide to go into sociology? Well, I just have, uh, I believe, the socio what C. Wright Bills calls a sociological imagination. Uh, and uh, I got it from my Aunt Nana. Uh, who in the 1950s and early 60s, I used to go visit her quite often, and I noticed there was a lot of tension going on in her neighborhood, and people were using words I hadn't used, hadn't heard before, like nigger and mm. all that kind of stuff. People, friends of hers were moving, and, 
and I asked her what happened, and somehow she was able to explain to me uh, what redlining was. Now, I don't know if oh, you know what know redlining what is. is. Well, uh, this is the time where you have the great migration up north to the factories mm -hmm. up in Chicago. Yeah. So the real estate industry is figuring out that if they can get these whites to be fearful enough to move, they can buy the houses cheap and sell them for higher prices oh, okay. to the blacks that are migrating through. And one of the ways you kind of enable that is through redlining by not giving loans in those areas either so people can't keep up their property. So okay. you, that you get this kind of pressure on a neighborhood, an area, that propels one group out and moves another group in. Oh, okay. So my aunt was able to explain this to me somehow. How, how old were you at this time? I time? was, well, I was 1952, so, you know, maybe between 8 and 10 years old or something oh, wow. like that. And she also explained um, uh, antitrust stuff. <laughs> She was amazing, and I just I just caught it. And so I was from very early age realized that, you know, I was a, a creature of time and space, as one of the great sociologists okay. says, you know, mm -hmm. that it's not just about me as a personality, but the historical time I come into and the place I come from very much influences what happens to me and how mm -hmm. I perceive things. So that understanding of power mm -hmm. came about very early <laughs> for me. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, so you had an interest in so like societal change long before you met Helen Bass Williams. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I was oh, doing okay. community organizing before I met Helen Bass Williams. I mean, number of issues. I at once worked, tried to uh, keep the first McDonald's out of our student center at SIU. Oh, okay. I, yeah. And uh, I knew I was not going to be able to do that, but I saw it as a beautiful opportunity for educating people about rainforest destruction because that's where the beef was from. Oh, actually, I didn't know that. Yep. Yeah. And there was a, a big campaign back then, uh, the, the commercial was Where's the Beef, comparing McDonald's burgers to other burgers, and, that, and mine was Where's the Beef From, oh, okay. and what its connections were. So rainforest destruction was you know, an issue back then in the late 70s, maybe 80s, mm -hmm. and so I just used that as a vehicle to talk about rainforest destruction. That's the mm -hmm. reason why we shouldn't have it in there. Mm -hmm. And I've got to speak all over the place about that and connecting our consumption to, you know, another place on the planet. And um, and uh, I think Helena and I shared that kind of sensibility that you don't have to win on an issue. Mm -hmm. You can use an issue to educate. Okay. And we were both into that kind of thing. Okay, great. And then what other, um, so you had a, a strong interest in like racial relations as well. So mm -hmm. from this story from your aunt, yeah. uh, long, long before you met Helen Bass Williams, were you involved in other community service work or community involvement? Uh, yeah, in I was. To that as well? I was a, a Vista worker. Uh, in the 80s, I believe. I'm terrible with my own time frames of oh, life. Oh, don't, don't answer uh, that. <laughs> and, and there I worked for a group called Southern Counties Action Movement. And what we were about were the really increasing um, electric rates in this area and that ordinary people didn't have representation. Mm -hmm. We also worked on some unemployment issues and that kind of thing. But we were part of the movement in Illinois to get the, uh, what did they call it, the CUB, which was the Citizens Utility Board. Okay. Yeah, and then, uh, yeah. So we, we did research and organized around rate hikes mm -hmm. and then worked for more citizen involvement in utility issues. So that was a job I had 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. And then I was an advocate for people coming out of mental institutions. That was okay. Which involved a lot of. Uh, well, I linked the two uh, because what happened was, at the time I was doing organizing on utility issues, Rosalind Carter was then the uh, first lady, mm -hmm. and she was one of her pet project was the deinstitute deinstitutionalization of mental okay. patients. And so I see that as an opportunity because one of the hardest things for me to do was get somebody coming out of a mental institution and get the deposits for them to get their utilities on. And I couldn't get them into public housing until they had the utilities turned on. And these you don't come out of there with 200 bucks yeah. to turn your utilities on. So that's how I linked up with this scam organization at first mm -hmm. at the hearings to say, we have to change this about these deposit policies. These are not fair. And we did, mm -hmm. we did do that. And so then I quit my job as a social worker mm -hmm. with those folks and then just went into working on community organizing. Okay, and then is that where you got inter or got involved with more um, like racial disparities, or was this were there actually like racial disparities with this cub organizing, like with your uh, cub organization no, as well? No, uh, not really. Oh, okay, Ra so race wasn't really um, uh, so much. Of course, you know that's always an underlying issue yeah. in anything with economics, but. Uh, that's where I came in touch with the number nine group that Helen, you know, she, that's where she grew up in the number nine domain area, which mm -hmm. was a small black coal mining town, uh, because we did work with them. Mm -hmm. So I became acquainted with the organization there that Helen worked with after she retired, the number mm -hmm. nine. Mm -hmm. And then um, where I first met Helen was at our annual meeting and my friend Mary Kay had gotten Helen as a speaker there. I was going to show you the, the brochure for that. And this is for SCAM or for number nine? For SCAM, Southern SCAM. Counties Action Movement. Oh, I thought I had it here and I, I don't. Well, we'll just have to oh, go back okay. to it. Um, but, yeah. So Helen uh, was there, and uh, she did some, she got up in front of the group and did some storytelling, mm -hmm. and it's the first time I saw her do this gesture combined with a comment that ended up being the title of the dissertation, Let It Fly, mm -hmm. because she started out by talking about the story of when she was a little girl, and they used to have the airplanes come in the area and give people rides. Okay. And she got on an airplane. Oh, wow. And she got up in the air, and she decided then and there that that's how she wanted to feel in her life, to let it fly. And she would do this, let it fly. Oh, Put her okay. three Put fingers, fingers to her heart. heart and then throw it out, let it fly. She used to have her, that phrase a lot for a variety of good and bad things. Okay. You know, so she's a fabulous storyteller. Mm -hmm. Tells some stories about the civil rights movement. And of course I had to go up and say it because I've already been taping stories and yeah, yeah. I've loved the stories of older women. And that's when I went up and introduced myself and told her if she ever wanted to talk more or needed anything, I gave her my phone number. Oh, okay. So yeah. you were the one who made that Made the, the connection. The initial, initial, con connection. Initial, initial connection. I did not expect her to call me or anything, but she did call me up. Mm -hmm. And I uh, went over there. I was really happy about it. Um, mm -hmm. Not for any particular purpose or a dissertation or anything, but just to be... Uh, to be around a long haul activist. I mean, that was part of the storytelling you got. This woman has been involved in it from, you know, 
early Very on, early on. And is still doing it. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, I was Christian, like, well, how in the heck does somebody keep doing this kind of stuff? And so that was really my initial reason for going over there. It was much more personal than it was anything to do with like professional or right. yeah it was professional in a sense but my pro yeah. profession was organizing and yeah you know how do you keep doing that kind of thing mm -hmm. um, and face up the money and the apathy and ignorance and mm -hmm. she hit on all those points and kept right on going so yeah from what I've read she's an amazing woman or was an amazing incredible woman. yeah So, your relationship with Helen Bass Williams then started as a personal one, because mm -hmm. it was more of just a personal connection mm -hmm. and every, like, everything like that. Can you mm -hmm. explain a little bit more about um, how your relationship with Helen Bass Williams developed? Because you ended up being quite close. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we did. We were very close. Um, you know, I talk about her being my spiritual mother. I, I'd have to say about myself that I have kind of always hung out with older women, like I told okay. you the story of my Aunt Nana yeah. and that, and I've always really listened to them. My grandmother, you know, I would listen to her stories about the Depression and was really, she really gave me a picture of what the Depression was like and what people would walk, to, come to their door and um, ask for food or something and how you would, you would give to people, or you would invite them in, and you would say, "Oh, but for the grace of God, go I." That kind of thing, and I, I found that so striking compared to a time where people were really fearful mm -hmm. of, you know, opening their doors or that yeah. kind of thing. So what I'm saying is that I've always had friendships with women that were older, and always loved listening to them and hearing their stories. So. Um, it was just kind of a natural fit and that here uh, Helen had you know somebody who really wanted to listen and had some kind of background about the civil rights movement mm -hmm. um, so uh, but I also helped her a lot with you know going to the doctor or you know looking at forms and okay. what you need to fill out to bring food in over. Um, but I would just go and visit, check on her, see how she was doing, and then sometimes we tape. I left all that completely up to her about okay. when she wanted to tape and what she wanted to tape. Uh, there were things I did not ask her about. She did not bring up, you know, like her husband or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. She didn't seem to want to talk about any of that. Okay. Uh, so we didn't. Yeah. Well, that's really good that you left it kind of up to her, like what she wanted to share. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. And she seemed pretty willing. So you have a lot of oral histories with her, right? So from your thesis, you had a lot of stories. That I she had a shared. lot of stories. The total time tape of tape stuff, I, I don't know how long that would be. Mm -hmm. um, I realized after her passing and we had always talked about the stuff that was in her garage and one day we were going to get at all that. <laughs> it's always one day. <laughs> one day we were going to get at all that. So I knew it was there and when she passed we had not gotten at all that. Mm -hmm. So she um, put me in her will for taking all her materials and that kind of thing and so I did not wait I went in and just took out bagfuls of stuff mm -hmm. and this is a lot of what you're seeing right now yeah in the front records of you that you have from Helen Bass Williams are from her uh, her field notes when she's working in the Head Start program mm -hmm. you know um, letters uh, from people from Purdue um, Things with her family, uh, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Yeah, a lot of the missing pieces that <laughs> yeah were for, for us, anyways. That yeah, we're yeah. There's still a lot of missing pieces for me, which will never <laughs> yeah. end out. You know, yeah. I wish I would like to have known more about her love affairs and things like that. You know, 
Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know anything about that, so. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I do know about one that was uh, was pretty interesting and must have been a major one in her life, and that was with um, Junior Hatchet. Okay. And there's some things in there about in there about Junior Hatchet, but Junior Hatchet had a road club in Dumaine Culp that was a black road club. Mm -hmm. And it was the place you went to for music, I am told. Okay. Because as the black musicians were traveling from uh, the South to Chicago, they stopped there okay. and played. So it was quite a hot spot. And Junior Hatchet was quite the guy. Mm -hmm. She broke right spot him a couple times in the number nine newsletter. Oh, okay. And um, I have a picture of him. And evidently they had uh, some kind of romantic relationship. Oh, and okay. I think Helen was quite enamored of him. And I think he may have broken off, and that was a, that was a real hard one for her. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Huh. Yeah, I'm really excited to look through all these records. Um... So, what was Helen Bass Williams like as a person? So you knew her really, like, later in life. Yeah. Um, I guess, like, after she's, like, developed as a person. Like, she's at, mm -hmm. you know, late in adulthood. She's had all these experiences. Um, so can you just tell us a little bit about what she's like? Well, or she, what she was like? Yeah, she, she was extremely charming. Mm-hmm. And she had a sense of, she had a variety of senses of humor from being like a silly little girl and using <laughs> baby talk uh, to, you know, quite sophisticated kind of ironic. And, you know, she could go through that and play them all very well. So we always had a lot of fun talking. Um, and, uh, uh just a very keen intellect and very diverse, mm -hmm. very well read. Still reading lots of newspapers, magazines, you know, in the end, and uh, keeping up with some of her friends from Purdue. And of course, she was viewed in that number nine community, in my opinion, and in in. Way. She described her relationship there one time to me. She said, sometimes here I feel like I'm an octopus, and instead of having tentacles, I just have giant titties, and everybody's trying to suck on them. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> There's that the humor. <laughs> and that's getting at the fact it's very poor community. Mining industry is, you know over there, population aging. She's one of the people that has a retirement and has some money. And people are taking things from her, using things and not bringing back, borrowing money, mm -hmm. this kind of stuff. Uh, and at the same time, she's dealing with, a, as she had all her life, this kind of this inbuilt sexism, even in the number nine community she's not her education and experience put her at a distance from people there and so she told me that people didn't sometimes believe that she had done these things oh, and, okay. yeah and they just didn't really know her impact or realize that and I I personally really identified with that because in my family um Getting an education not was not necessarily something your parents were proud of. It really? set, yeah, it, it, it set you apart from. And I saw that in community colleges too. A lot of community college kids had problems with that. Once they got an education and were like questioning, well, you're so smart, you've been to college, and da, da, da. You're, you're you're demeaned for it. And I think Helen, I, well, I know she she had to deal with that. Mm -hmm. But yet you had to respect her intelligence and her resources, so she did play a role. But I walked in one time when these guys were robbing her. Really? 
and um, people she knew or uh, I would have imagined that she knew them the situation hmm. was I was coming for a visit and you know I she left her door open and you just I just walked in and I see these two black guys in there and they're coming right at me and I'm thinking what are they in here for I have never seen these fellows before and I just said, oh, are you visiting with Helen? Is she napping or whatever? And they said, yeah, we're visiting, but she got tired. And then they walked out the door. Well, when Helen, I woke her up and everything, mm -hmm. we realized that they had, you know, taken medication and things like that. Oh, okay. So, so she yeah. had some stuff to deal with there. Was she, what was the number nine community like? Like, was it... A lower income area or well there's some very really astounding people that came out of that area there's a, a um, oh gee I wish I had it more on the tip of my tongue some people that you know got their educations one of them I think was a woman pilot oh wow yeah black woman pilot I want to say and uh, a couple of other folks too but there was a lot of poverty mm -hmm. there as well. And then there were people that worked at SIU or Jenny Logan College, and those folks generally had. But if you read the newsletter, you'll get a, a better sense than from me. I okay. didn't live there, you know, and yeah. so, uh, but it was, it was a community that was definitely trying to improve itself, and still is. There's mm -hmm. still a, a number nine community. Now, I don't know if they do the newsletter. I know they're interested in in uh, the history of, of that and I've given them a lot of like I've photocopied things and okay. given them that, that kind of information um, but people knew each other and, and were very much related to one another and mm -hmm. uh, Helen's family I mean they were um, funeral parlor they did the funeral parlors and as well as being coal miners, you know. So. Okay. And was her mother, mother's side involved with the funeral part? Her father died quite, when Young, she was quite Yeah, it was her mother's side of the family, I believe. Okay. Uh, and number nine is where her mom ended up residing? Is that why yeah, her mom yeah, or moved culp, back there? Yeah, oh, culp, culp. culp and number nine. I don't know where these boundaries, there's Dumaine, which is where Helen grew up in and she's buried in the Dumaine Cemetery across the way and Dumaine is a ghost town. I have some pictures of it uh, when I finally got back in there but Helen lived in, they called it number nine but the, the distinction of what's number nine and what's culp is unclear to me. I'm sure people okay. that live there know okay. but I don't. But Dumaine was specifically, or uh, number nine was the number nine coal shoot. Okay. Coal mine, and, and um, I, it was predominantly black, as was the domain. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then what was she, so she was still very active later in life, so she retired from Purdue, I think, in like yeah. 1978, and then moved back yeah. to Culp, Culp or, num num or number, number nine, nine. Yeah. Um, to take care of her mother, right? Right. Yeah. And then yeah. what was she still... Do you know what she was involved with in that no, community? Because she was still, I did read that she was still very active. Yeah, she was part of the original group that um, formed the, you know, are in the Articles of Incorporation for the Number Nine community. Now, I, I have those. Those aren't included in your files. If you want those, I can pull them out and give okay. them to you. Um because I took some stuff out from number nine that I didn't think he would be interested in. So she, she was on that. She also performed a role which she performed at many other educational institutions, and that is she linked community with the educational institutions in the okay. area. So um, she was working with the community development department at SIU mm -hmm. much earlier than I went into it. Um, and having those students and working with those students and faculty to help number nine form this organization and work with people. Okay. So she did that. Okay. 
And that's how she was, I guess, so involved with people within her community. So these people who you mentioned mm -hmm. would come over to her house. So same thing she did, like, pretty much everywhere she lived. She opened up her home to the Yeah, her home was open, yeah. And she had, uh, you know, she had her cooking vessels, she called them vessels. Yeah, I read about those. <laughs> yeah. Now, I don't know if they're the same ones I have that she <laughs> gave to me, but uh, if they were, uh, they were pretty darn expensive ones. She, she yeah. loved good cooking things. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. There's, and, uh, you know, she always had, now she had a, somebody, a housekeeper that came in, and she would tell her what she wanted cooked, and she'd have a big pot of that kind of thing on the stove, and, yeah. And she'd just feed anyone who came over, right? I, I, yeah, if anybody thought that they needed to, it wasn't like it was, mm -hmm. but people did come over and visit a lot. You'd be over there and be interrupted, yeah. you know, at least once. Mm -hmm. um, I remember one time she, yeah, we were, I was there and these two women from the community came in and I guess they came in and regularly visited her because um, I think they were trying to get her involved in their church. Oh, okay. And... Uh, and they were, you know, very conservative, Baptist type. And they just well, well, we're just on our way to feed his sheep, and we thought we'd stop by. And so then they just started talking about spreading the word. Okay. And she did that, and then she did people bring their kids by. and That's wonderful. Mm-hmm. That's great. So, um... When did you decide to start studying her experience as an activist, like actually studying it? So, because you wrote your PhD on uh, Helen Bass Williams' experience as a civil rights activist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I had so I had gone back to graduate school, and in that process, I had done a couple of narratives and worked on an oral history project. One of them was studying um, a group of nurses at a hospital north of here that were going on strike to unionize, and I taped their stories. I wanted to see how much their motivation, spirit for doing this was uh, connected to family legacies, particularly okay. of coal mining. Mm -hmm. And that was definitely there. I mean, once once you know, I tapped into that, then the stories just you know just came. They learned a lot, and they used that. And then uh, I worked on the Cairo Oral History Project, and you know, I'm not remembering if I did this before or after Helen. I think I did it before. To check that out, <laughs> um, but that was interviewing. I don't know if you're familiar with Cairo, Illinois, but it was a real hot spot in the civil rights era. Okay, um, there was a big boycott that went on there with the black community just saying we're not going to buy anything from these white stores. And was that because of like segregation issues? Yes, yeah, segregation, yeah. not hiring. Um, Issues of housing; these things are still going on. There's a yeah. major one of our uh, uh, reporters from the Southern Illinois has just won some significant awards on her investigation of public housing. Oh, okay. It, they had to close down the public housing. It was run down so poorly, and the money that the white power elite was taking out of that—they were the board members on the—it's mm -hmm. just incredible, just incredible. So Cairo has been a deep source of exploitation. Um, and so one of the professors, Kathy Ward, had uh, organized this project along with, um, um, oh, I forgot her first name, Jan, Jan Roddy, who's a photographer. So there was a combination of putting together oral histories with um, uh, uh, pictures. And I interviewed a black woman community worker, Ann Winters an African-American woman who was um, very involved and uh, really, I don't think she would describe it this way at all, but um, you really saw the sexism of the movement mm -hmm. through what kinds of things happened 
to her or did, okay. but she just hung in there. I remember she said to me, you just never know what seeds you're going to plant. You just got to go out there and plant them. You just okay. got to do that. So she would describe things like uh, what the situations were like in Cairo, where in these public housing projects, the white women would have their their clothing brought in for the black women to wash, you know. Okay. But you know the the what, black women couldn't use the washing facilities in town or that. Yeah. And she say, you know, come on, do you think we're not going to throw some of our clothes in when we're washing? You know. And another situation she described was where the white women actually organized to keep a business out because they didn't want to use, lose their maids. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, had that kind of sensibility about what was going on in southern Illinois. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of... Yeah, so I started to develop this kind of uh, bigger picture of the micro level of the movement and uh, black women leadership mm-hmm. in it and what they call bridge leaders or uh, black women community workers and just really got to have experience with, with them directly. Okay. And you were doing those recordings, sorry, before or after you interviewed Helen Bass Williams? Because this kind of started out more I personal, know, right? I know, And then developed into... Yes, yes, I know. And I've got to try to think of... I'm going to have to go back, let me write down, and, and tell you that for yeah, sure. Yeah, no I'm worries. I'm sorry. That's great. Tell which came first. <laughs> K-Rule Project or Helen? I can do that very quickly. Because I pulled out, I had, you know, the interview with Helen, mm-hmm. uh, with Mrs. Winters, and that stuff I pulled out of here. Okay. Yes. Uh, I had it in here with the Helen stuff. It's okay. a part of the Black Women Community Research, mm-hmm. and I pulled that out so I can tell you when that was right from there and related to. Okay, great. Um, and so your dissertation is predominantly it's centered around Helen Bass Williams, right? It's putting her in a historical context. Uh, using um, the bridge leadership tier, what the mm-hmm. sociologists called it, putting mm-hmm. her into their experiences, their institutions, because some of them were the same. Helen worked for the Tuberculosis Association, so did other black women leaders. Um, and then she met certain people, you know, like uh, Septima Clark, and and so I wanted to um, put her in that context, and then I also wanted to understand her storytelling mm-hmm. as it related to social movements on a couple of different levels. One is what it revealed, what they revealed about what is called micro-mobilization, Okay. That's that stuff at the very grassroots where you can see people responding to uh, power and power responding to them. Uh, you can see the forms of discrimination, how people responded to them. Uh, you can see uh, free spaces that they create in order to expand, you know, possibilities. Um and so I, I wanted, there's kind of a theoretical thing I wanted to uh, examine through those stories. And then um, the function of those stories and how Helen used them. Because what became evident after I went through those black bags that were in her garage was she had practiced writing these stories long before she told them to me. Oh, okay. And you can find that right in there. There was a set number of stories, and you can find those handwritten that she was working on. And you'll also see them mentioned in the number nine newsletter before I come along. So I became interested in what the function 
of the stories were. And when I got into that, I found some pretty interesting stuff. Some people who are pretty committed to the idea that storytelling is essential to mo and the stories we tell each other are very important in social movements. It's where new sense of possibility, examples of change, you know, are given. You know, you, you see leadership that are your own. Um, how people deal with conflict. Um, and so I came across a fellow by the name of Kling. He's in the, just in his stuff on narratives and social movements, I believe is the name of his, his book. Um, I, I just became very interested in Helen's stories in that context as well. It makes you wonder. It's making me wonder now about storytelling and social movements okay. at this very complex time we're in right now. Mm -hmm. I haven't got any answers okay. for you. Or anything, but I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of mulling that in my mind. What is the function of storytelling now? Is storytelling is so much more complicated now because the stories people are hearing are not around their tables. No, it's. I, it's, You're kind of separated from whoever's telling. In some cases, you don't actually know who's telling them. So. Right. Yeah. They're yeah. things that you see online, or right. Or Rachel Maddow weaves a story around an issue. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's storytelling going all around. Trump mm -hmm. does it in his. There's a lot of storytelling, but storytelling in social movements now, and storytelling when Helen was doing very, very different. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't. But I think anybody that runs for office better be aware of storytelling. <laughs> I mean, any progressive needs to know the importance of the storytelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because she really, so she kind of used it to inspire people mm -hmm. to be involved. I don't know. I think I did ask her if she actually told these stories to people, and yes, she did. Mm-hmm. And then she wrote about them, mm -hmm. too. And they were, see, they're like folk tales. And that's one of the things that I wanted to kind of understand. Because when you listen to the stories, like sometimes she tells them in the third person. She's Miss okay. Helen. Well, that's also a story that she's talking about, what I believe is a rape. Okay. But she doesn't. She described it as them just spitting in her, just spitting in her mouth. Yeah. And so she's uh, what disassociating. Mm -hmm. So some of the stories are like that, and it, and it was like it was, at that point in time it was like could could people have really done that to her? You know, there's this, mm -hmm. uh, and then some of them have a silly kind of quality. And yet, I found out at the funeral where there were some people there, those were really things that, you know, there was a blue goose. There was a, oh, I mean, okay. you know, because some people, and these were, these were predominantly white people, would listen to and hear those stories and not understand the folktale nature mm -hmm. of storytelling and how you create a story so that it's retold, so it's folky, you know. Yeah. And so I had to come to those kinds of, understandings about storytelling okay and then a lot of these or some of them at least the ones that I read through your dissertation mm -hmm. were quite they were retelling quite violent mm -hmm. experiences mm -hmm. yes yeah yeah the um, uh, spit story mm -hmm. is definitely one of them and then there's another one where she's uh, gets pulled over um, and she ends up in jail yeah and you know the guards for fun yeah. hit the men and women and uh, so reminiscent of what the uh, plantation owners did mm -hmm. uh, to get people to breed lock them up in the barns give them booze and yeah and so yeah she saw and, and, and shootings and yeah yeah, so the shooting of 
believe the man who went to vote. Yes. And then yeah. there was the parade as well. Oh, Tessie. Yeah. Tessie. Yeah. And Tessie was a real person. Um, yeah. All those kinds of things. And, uh, and then on a professional level, too, when she was taking people in the Head Start to go to doctors to get immunized, the white nurses refusing to give. Yeah. Uh, this kind of stuff, um, yeah, just all kinds of violence and affronts to human dignity. Yeah, always, always there. And as of course you probably bred in there, and that was not something I talked about while she was alive because she did not want me to, but she was raped, mm -hmm. and that was very, um, very. Uh, very difficult for her, and she had to keep it quiet, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so she said, so she didn't want you to talk about it while she was alive, but she said it was fine after she had passed. I'm, I'm not so sure about that. I think I mentioned it in here, though, that she was, yeah. so, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, so... Did she ever talk about what inspired her to get involved in the civil rights movement? Cause she was, yeah, she's quite early, I believe. Yeah, she her wanted to be involved. Her sensibilities of um, power, what kinds of things were shaping her life and the life of her community are embedded in her mining camp, being in the mining camp, and her father's role as an elected leader in the UMW, which, asking about things which surprised me, uh, because, you know, growing up in Chicago at a certain time it was you know how the unions were keeping blacks out and it just did not see unions as a democratizing uh, you know force mm -hmm. but evidently there is that story to be told by the U and the United Mine Workers um, and she gave me a book which I've put in the book collection it's good to be black it's about uh, and it's the subtitle it's good to be black in southern Illinois it is about being a black miner's daughter in Ducoin, and her father also was an elected. You know, so that was there. And she remembers having meetings at the house and sitting while her father was doing his work, and there were white and black people there. And plus, as you can see by the pictures, Helen's skin tone was very light. She could pass. She could mm -hmm. pass and did pass and used it sometimes okay. to uh, show the contradictions right in front of people. Mm -hmm. You know, like taking, going into a store and buying all this merchandise and having black students with her and them not allowing the black students to try on clothes and Helen had all this pile of stuff at the checkout counter and when they won't allow these young women to change, well, I'm not buying anything here. I'm, you know, that kind of thing. So she did that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she was discriminated against within the black community for her smarts and her her white yeah. Okay, her skin tone. Her skin tone, mm -hmm. yeah. Which, that's documented, the this, this skin tone stuff, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did read that in your dissertation as well. I think you yeah. mentioned that there. Yeah. Now, I wish, if, if I had to do over again with what I know now, and my kind of my current research on Helen Bass Williams is going back into that genealogy. Because I did have dates and places and things like that. And I wonder how much Helen knew about her own family history because it is incredible in terms of that legacy of struggle that she might just have always grown up hearing about these people, 
her grandfather, the first black, uh, you know, supervisor or something at the railroad in, in Union County, you know. Mm-hmm. They were the only black family. Her, her One of her aunts played in the window, you know, of the piano store. And then another great-great-grandfather being with Elijah Lovejoy and the, the Underground Railroad movement and being honored up in... Yeah. And then, of course, on her on her um, mother's side, all the coal mining deaths in in big oh. coal mining accidents. You know, some mm-hmm. of the big ones. Oh wow! And then the separate the separate places on the the group tombstones for the black miners and white miners. You can see it right. Oh, I didn't know the, that. The, yeah, that's yeah. On this genealogy, I put one of the pictures in there of that. Okay. So, I wonder how much Helen knew of all that. I would imagine she did. Okay. And I wish I would have known about it to ask <laughs> her more about yeah. it. Yeah. Um. Uh. But that was definitely there. Okay. So she came from a long legacy of. Yeah family members who were involved in yeah civil rights or politics or and that's really one activism. of the things that you see in studying this bridge leadership mm-hmm. the ongoing legacy of struggle it's okay. the next generation picks up the mm-hmm. the ball what was um i guess like the most surprising interesting or unexpected thing that you learned from Helen Bass Williams like from her stories from her stories, um, well, I mentioned the one about uh, the UMWA and how that worked. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, intergroup said it, the conflict within groups based on skin tone, the discrimination okay. based on skin tone. I mean, how that played out for her. Um, the um, internal conflicts within the civil rights movement uh, based on different strategies of organizing. Mm -hmm. And um, Helen, of course, comes from um, the background of what is called emancipatory education, Pablo Freire. But, I mean, she met him and, and they had and Miles Horton, and and she already had those ideas. They meshed her ideas about what education was about. Mm -hmm. And so you have this kind of emancipatory education and organizing, and then you had what we called the Miles Horton School of Organizing, which was, you know, set out a goal, get people angry about it, organize and get it. But in Helen's... It was about the focus is on education of individuals along this process. Mm-hmm. And so I forgot what the question was at that po- this point. Now I got off on that. But anyway, yeah. Oh, I think you completely answered it, though. Oh. It's just what we kind of found most surprising from doing oh, yeah, these yeah. mysteries. Yeah. Or from reading her stories, speaking to her. Yeah. yeah. And that difference really comes into the movement, into the Head Start movement. See, there's, she's got a tremendous story about, about Head Start that would require a lot more, um, I think, um, research. But there were divisions. I mean, like, she was not a fan of Fannie Lou Hamer's because they had different ideas. She viewed Fannie Lou and her connections with... I think what she saw, I don't think I'm using the correct term for this, but they were more like the leftist young folks that were coming to organize, not all of them, but you know, some that um, they were more traditionalists. And what did she, oh, and she was um, an integrationist. Yeah. And the difference that, um, Fannie Lou and those folks wanted that has they wanted them to be black organizations. They wanted it to be a black head start. They wanted everybody to be, you know, black on the board of the head starts that were starting. And Helen did not 
believe in that. She believed that you're trying to get people to learn from each other, and it was an educational process. Mm -hmm. And um, so she has some direct writings on that. So she she was not, um, you know, uh, in with some aspects of the movement. Okay. And I think that's why um, you'll see she was able to move more fluidly in white power structures to certain extents because she did have a commitment to education and integration. Um, okay. okay. Um, so she was, she was active in the civil rights movement in like the 50s, 60s. Mm -hmm. um, did she, and she actually worked with Septima Clark and yeah. Rosa Parks, I believe, as well? Well, they were on the board. Now, I don't know how she worked with Rosa Parks, but okay. I know that those people were on the board of the Highlander when she was on the board of Highlander. So oh, there was, okay. you know, I believe Eleanor Roosevelt was on the board of Highlander oh, when she okay. was, you know. Right. So I don't know. The one I directly know... Um, um, Ella Baker too was one of them uh, is Septima Clark in that uh, she was Helen was very much interested in the citizenship schools um, and Septima Clark was a major organizer in that and Septima Clark was also a teacher Helen was a teacher and so she went to South Carolina and got Septima Clark to come up to the Highlander. Oh, so, so she, she okay. yes. So she made that link, and of course, people don't realize what the Highlander School, the role it played in the Civil Rights Movement, was very, very powerful. I mean, it was burnt, and I mean, because you could be, it was in, you were allowed to be integrated there, mm -hmm. and people wanted to shut that down, and they were just, they were embracing the style of organizing that was very powerful, I believe, and effective. Mm -hmm. So it's my understanding that, you know, um, things like, um, oh, um, Septima Clark, um, Rose Parks, that whole thing was planned at the Highlander Center. This was not a spontaneous oh. act. Oh, okay. So the bus? The bus, yeah. Oh, okay. Spin, that, was, that was planned. Oh, okay. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. yeah. These people, are, yeah. Okay, so the Highlander School, um, so they're integrated, but they're also teaching people to be involved in grassroots movements and different ways that they could be involved. And, right? uh, but it, more that they were helping people learn from each other rather than teaching them, okay. they were recognizing. And then, she, you know, what people were doing and bringing that together and reflecting on it and, you know, acknowledging the dimensions of, you know, there's thought, there's feeling, and there's action involved in, in learning. Okay. And, um, and, you know, that has to be a part of what you're doing. Okay. It, you know, thinking mm -hmm. about that kind of stuff, and okay, and so she brought Septima Clark to Highlander School. What was her relationship with her after? Like, did they remain in touch? Did they remain? I have no idea. I don't know. Helen was not one to keep in. T she was really grass rootsy. Mm -hmm. She did not go about for, I, and, and I wish I had asked more about that. I mean, I do have an interview there where I ask her about people, and but she wasn't that much interested in, know, you know, the um, um, person, the big personalities of the okay. civil rights movement. She was not into remembering that. She was more into remembering you know, um, the ladies that served the food or got the water going okay. for the well and what happened with them and what they did. That's mm -hmm. what she was more interested in remembering and thinking about. Okay. Now, she did stay in touch with um, Reverend King, not Martin Luther King, but the, the white fellow, oh, and I'm forgetting his name, 
um, Ed King, mm. who was a very, I think he was controversial too. Um, yeah, there was some controversy going on there with the head starts and him and Helen and all that, which she wasn't, which we did not talk about. Okay. Because, yeah. She didn't want to? No, I don't okay. think, I think that there were, you know, there's people that still are looking at that and have some questions. You know, I did get a phone call. It was interesting because I got a phone call before you. I got a phone call probably about two months or so ago from a fellow who was doing a study and had gotten a hold of my dissertation and was asking me for specific pieces of information out of my file. Um, and as I talked to him more, I realized he was, he said he was doing a different type of history about that time okay. that focused in on, you know, the white leaders that were helping blacks. Okay. And one of them was this Owen Cooper, who's mentioned in there, who was the head of the board at MAP. Okay. And I think he's the person that eventually fired Helen. Oh. And he, he wanted letters that I had from him. And, um... So I don't know what that was all about. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I didn't, I actually, I was very, very sick at the time. You're seeing me in a whole new form than I was a year ago. Oh, really? Yeah, I was very, very sick. And so I could not, and Tom could have done it, but I just, I couldn't get down to the basement to get this stuff. I couldn't, I had to learn how to walk. I lost my ability to walk. Really? And so um, he never got that stuff. <laughs> I'd okay. sent him what stuff I had for my computer. Mm-hmm. But he was wanting more detailed things that I just did not have okay. on the computer. Well, I'm glad to see that you're doing much better. Oh, I am. Oh, That's great. Gosh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, so you did mention that she didn't really talk too much about her or keep too much in touch with these big players. Did she mm -hmm. ever, and this, you may have answered mm -hmm. this, um, did she ever mention um, protesting alongside Martin Luther King Jr.? Um, you know, she might have in one of these news articles. There's one where she, she smears um, meat on her hands before she goes into a march so that she, um, the, the dogs will lick her. She knew dogs. She knew German shepherds. She had... A, German Shepherd, Big Mama. Mm -hmm. um, Her name is Big Mama? I think it was Big Mama. And then she had That's another. Great. Oh, she had a little dog that was called. And this is her very sense of humor. Nigger. But she made the white folks call him Mr. Nigger. <laughs> That's, I mean, wow. there's some weird things. I <laughs> don't get by with that kind of stuff because she bat her eyes and do it. Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. So she was funny. With her. she had animals, cats, and yeah. Wow. Lots of animals. How did That's we great. get off on that? Uh, oh, Martin Luther King. Jr. Martin Luther yeah. King. Yeah. That article. I should just try to pull out for you and find that so you can, because I think that is at a march. But I've never seen Helen in any front line. Um, Photographs of of Helen. Um, this was an article Bridget Walsh did for a local newspaper that was going for a while. Okay. And it features Helen, and then she talks about that. Uh, uh, I think she talks about that. Okay. In here about my prairie citizen. Mark. Yeah, you can take this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and this, by the way, is how she wore her hearing aid dangling outside. Oh. <laughs> outside, she was funny. I might find a couple of these in here. Okay, so that's so that's that. Okay. Um, 
she didn't talk. Yeah, it's like I said, she didn't talk a lot about the stars of the civil rights movement. She really was focused in on ordinary people and what they did. Okay. In the Head Start movement, particularly. Um, and then what she did with her actions, you know, like at Purdue. Uh, she knew what needed to be done for those black students to survive. And that meant food, a suitcase, uh, just some basic things that were completely out of their realm. Mm-hmm. So yeah. she actually helped recruit students for Purdue, right? <sighs> Did she ever talk about her time at Purdue? Oh, yeah. There's letters in there. Now, the recruitment part, I know that what she did was she really helped them when they got to Purdue. I don't know what her involvement was, but I know she did student recruiting. Um, she took the students from Tougaloo, where she worked, and she brought them to the Highlander Center, mm-hmm. the yeah. back roads. Yeah, I did read about that. Yeah, and so she she really loved working with the students. She writes and talks more about that kind of thing than mm-hmm. anything else. Okay. And did she, so at Purdue, so she helped recruit them and then helped support them while they were going, like attending Yeah, you'll university. find a lot in the correspondence there on that because, you know, I went through that again and I just thought to myself, wow, she was really navigating some stuff here because Purdue wanted, it appeared, you know, wanted to have these things for black students and all that, but then where's the money? What are we... Do you recognize what's really... Helen knew what needed to be done. Mm -hmm. I mean, her her interest in theory and education and learning goes way back. And you'll see grants. She was an excellent grant writer. (coughs) <coughs> You'll see grants she worked on in there. Okay. For Purdue, um, she worked with Mary and Andres Fifey from Purdue, and that relationship is a very, very special one. She and Mary worked on grants for Tougaloo, and Mary was at Purdue. This is yeah. early on, mm-hmm. and Mary's the one who brings her to Purdue. Yeah, and they met at Tougaloo. That's how they met, right? I'm not sure exactly how they met, but you know what? It's going to be on that tape or the transcript of the tape because I have two tapes of the interview with Mary Fifey. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And they they hit it off. Yeah. They they worked together for a long, long time. Yeah. Um, And did they continue working together while she was at Purdue? Do you have, did you know anything about that? I don't know about that exactly. I think they may have. You might be able to really specify that by going through the letters. Okay. Yeah. But I think one of the things I found revealing, and this is one of the things I went through yesterday, was um, I came across a letter uh, to somebody who was working at Purdue. Now, this guy might still be alive, Luther Williams, and he was like a biology. He's You can Google him. He's still alive. He's a black fellow, and, I mean, he's, you know, in terms of science and education and all that, he's really moved up and around, so Luther Williams. But at that time, he was a younger man at Purdue, and he was like a student or faculty. Faculty, yeah, faculty. And he was having some issues, and um, and I think you could discern them more from reading the letter. But um, it's amazing to me how Helen is trying to work with him so he understands the institution better and that these people and what his strengths are and then these other people that he sees himself in opposition to which he might look at a different way so it's like this really personal letter about him as a leader and about working with institutional power okay and I think um, I wrote him down as a person that might be somebody you'd want to interview if you could get in touch with him Luther Williams. Mm-hmm. 
So, yeah, the student unrest stuff, yes, there's stuff. I have a file in there on that. I found this this morning. I'm almost afraid to open it, but I know what's in here because it's so fragile. This is a big picture. If I kept unrolling it, and I don't want to do that necessarily, but this is at Purdue. I don't know who so did this. from the 1969, 68, 69 purchase? Yes. And I, my understanding of this picture is this is Helen trying to get the students to go back in. You can see some symbols in that. Okay. So I don't, yeah, yeah. Well, there are things that are going to look at this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's that for you. And so, she, was she heavily involved in um, the student, like in the protest going on at Purdue? Did she, she did ever not, talk about she that? She did not talk about that very much. Okay. No, she really didn't. There's a little un. Okay. Un did she talk Purdue. much to you about her time at Purdue? She talked mostly about her working with students and having to work at that very basic level of making sure they had certain basic needs met. Mm -hmm. Um, in order for them to make it and understand the system and, you know, that her door was open and she was feeding people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, in fact, she's got a letter in there about, you know, hey, I spent this much of my money and it's to some administrator and I hope we're figuring these kinds of things in there. Okay. I mean, she was working to get resources okay. and build that program in various nooks and crannies in, at Purdue. Okay. And did she get much support back from the administration? Did she ever mention that? Um, I think, so. I, you know what, I, I, I'm reluctant. I think if you read back through these letters and you, is Anthony Zamora still there? Is no, more, I think he retired, but he was the director of the Black Cultural Center. Yes, she helped. Yeah, so he would be a person that could tell. There's letters from him in there. Mm -hmm. But if you read all those letters that are from the Purdue period, and I think you might get a sense more, and that he would help you, or if he read them. And yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, because she did not talk about that. She talked about a lot of fine people she worked with there. Oh, like who? Do you uh, remember any of them? Uh, well, uh, well, Mary was one Mary of them. Mary was five. And, um, oh boy, who was there? Was another. Uh, Zamora, she mentioned, I mm -hmm. believe. Um, oh, I put this out here. These were people you asked about her funeral and who came to it. Yeah. And, um, uh, let's see. There, here's the... written by, delivered by. Oh, David Matthew. Yeah, she knew him and spoke well of him. I don't, I don't know what her sensibility. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. That's just. Okay, so she didn't talk too much, I guess, about her time at Purdue. Yeah. Okay. No, she, we didn't get there. Okay. But you'll see the grants she wrote. And her, her writing, her ideas about what needed to be done there for the That's students. Mm -hmm. She spent a lot of time on that. As she did with Head Start, too. She had very definite ideas, as did Mary Fifey. Mary Fifey starts her education in a one-room schoolhouse. She's a one-room schoolhouse teacher. Oh, wow. And so was Helen. Helen was the teacher at Dumaine, in Dumaine, mm -hmm. the black school. And they were just consummate educators, both of them. Mm -hmm. And so they had very definite ideas about what needed to occur in the classroom for the child and the parent and what resources would be needed. And so they wrote these things into grants. Um, yeah. 
And that's when she was in Mississippi and the She Head was Star in Tugelo. She was doing it with Mary Fifey, doing grants with Mary Fifey in, in Tugelo about a French program there. Okay. Said, I don't speak French fluently. Yeah. 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 And her, really sister, her master's yeah. paper is on a French. She had Very extraordinary range of interests. Mm -hmm. She she was not stuck in anything. Yeah. I mean, I think that probably was one of her, um, uh, what made her resilient was she was just so curious about the world and excited by things, even when she was older. I mean, the stories of her, and she told me one story where, you know, she had to go to the dentist and, and, um, but she didn't mind going to the dentist because the dentist had National Geographic books. Oh. <laughs> and so she could look through those magazines, mm -hmm. you know. She said, then I'd go up and I'd climb the tree and I'd be the sailor that was sailing off here and there, you know. And she just had that playfulness and imagination. And she still had that, but she was physically very limited towards the end. Okay. So, you know, she'd get, she'd get all these garden magazines, you know, and we'd sit there and look. Now, she couldn't go out and plant a garden or anything, but she loved looking at that kind of thing. She loved beautiful things. She loved clothes, you know. Mm -hmm. She loved looking at beautiful children. You yeah. Know? So. Yeah. Well, from all her work, it sounds like she really... Love children, loves yeah. working with students. Like that is kind of a recurring theme, like throughout her life. Yeah, yeah, and she really was able to look at people and get this sense of possibility from them. I just don't know. I I, I wrote. I was looking back at what I've written about her. Let me see. There was something that I thought, and and also this letter I mentioned to you from about. Um, that Mr. Williams that I think you should try to get a hold of. Um, uh, let's see if I have anything here. Oh, she knew how to juggle compassion and conflict mm -hmm. and bring that in a very present way to situations. And she saw possibility in people's internal conflicts and contradictions when others did not. And how that increased her choices for action. I mean, I just, she was really imaginative at both that individual level and also at a community level mm -hmm. with making, you know, these um, projects or that come alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. Um, so, so she passed away in 1991. And you attended her funeral, right? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. um, Can you tell me a bit about 1991, like, that year, like, her last year? Like, what was going what was going on in her life? Like, you said her health was pretty bad at that point. Yeah, she was, she was really pretty much confined to her home. Mm -hmm. And going out was very, very hard on her. Okay. Um, so she wasn't driving. I would drive her places. And um, so, you know, life was pretty much around her table. You'll hear that squeaky, squeaky chair she sat in when you when you listen to the interviews. Yeah. Um, her um, hernia. She had this very large, she had a botched hernia operation, and oh. she never, she didn't get it fixed right or whatever, so that was a constraint to her. She had heart problems, she was having trouble sleeping. Mm. So just you know, kind of a yeah, compilation of issues. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but she was uh, good humored when you'd go over there. She was never one to um, make the center of our visits about her her complaints. Okay. Um, just, we talked kept, about other things, yeah. Kept her personality. Yeah. 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 That's great. Um, so for, so you attended her funeral. Did any, um, did any other people that she was involved with during the civil rights movement attend the funeral? Yes, and they were more from the grassroots level. They okay. were Annie from, um, Annie and the Voodoo Lady. 
Okay. And, you know, then I was like, I asked her, now nah, that story about the gun, and then she goes, oh, yeah. You know, and there was another lady, too. But there wasn't um, time and um, things just didn't work out with me getting the interviews I yeah. needed or wanted or, mm-hmm. yeah. But there were no big, like... Oh, no. Oh, no. Stars, yeah. Yeah. no, um, that that were there. But they're the people that she worked with, a Greta, um, I forgot, is it Greta Brown? Or a, a came and, and Greta had worked with her in the Civil Rights Movement, and uh, in the Head Start Movement, I mm-hmm. think, when she was at MAP. Okay. So she tended to remain in touch with those people. There's lots of pictures in here you'll see. I have no idea. Who they are. I have okay. some identified through Helen's uh, cousin Leela, um, but because okay. we did not go through pictures. Mm-hmm. Are you still in touch with Leela? Leela's deceased. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I interviewed well, Leela. Well before. Yeah, uh, I interviewed Leela after Helen died, and I had this box of photos, mm-hmm. and she was about the only person I knew that would be able to identify people okay. in it. So I did meet with her, and mm-hmm. and you'll you'll see that box and its strengths and weaknesses in terms yeah. of historical <laughs> stuff. There's just a lot of people in there that I, I just don't know. Yeah. To me, what's become curious about them now is there's about four or five reoccurring pictures of this family that the guy looks white and the woman could pass for are white and they've got a child that looks white and then in the back there's you know two and it's a family picture these people are all physically close and they're just you know and I'm wondering if that's from um, her mother's side of the family the Spears family if those people weren't related to Helen because one of the things I've been finding out in her genealogy from her mother's side is that that Spears family may have become black Okay, like mixed race? They may have become, yeah, that they were white, and then at a certain point in time in history, one of the white guys marries a a mulatto woman, and from there on in the census data, they get all mixed up as to what they are. Okay. And and so I'm thinking, oh, this must be, I think this must be somebody from the Spears family. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, and that Spears, that white Spears family goes all the way back. They're in the the uh, Revolutionary War, you know, they're in, uh, if if I'm on the right track. Okay. And I can't be absolutely sure of that, but. Yeah, it's hard when you go that far back. (laughs) Yeah, and you don't have anybody to reference. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and she has no survival, as far as you know, no surviving relatives, eh? Not that I know of, no. Wow. No. Mm-hmm. Now there are people in cult that still know how on that you know. Would oh be, really? Yeah. That that were number nine. Okay, mm-hmm. involved in that community group. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, that would know more about that that community and also Helen's family. Oh, okay. That would be really great to know. Mm-hmm. Okay, oh, their names. Great. Contact. That would be fantastic. Um, how did she start? So she was involved in forming, I guess, is this a community group in the number nine community? And then mm-hmm. they started putting out this newsletter. Mm-hmm. They so formed, the they incorporated under the state of Illinois. Okay. And I think these were all the things that... SIU and Helen and them all worked on to what do you have to do to form a community organization. And boy, you see all the range. I mean, these are two-page, legal-sized newsletters. Helen's got a column in there. Uh, There's columns about apartheid, but a lot of it is community news, who's in visiting, uh, that kind of thing. Okay. And was their primary, I guess, what was their primary objective in this? Do you... I think keeping their community connected, remembering their roots, okay. and you know, being able to be recognized in Southern Illinois as as a group. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and then so that's how she started writing for this newsletter mm-hmm. for the number nine. Yeah. Okay. 
So, um, what are some of your fond, like strongest or most fond memories of Helen Bass Williams? Well, my fondest memory, and I thought I mailed this to you, but then I I, I looked and it didn't appear on there. My fondest memory of being with Helen is on a beautiful, clear spring day in Southern Illinois with blue sky and big white clouds and us out for a ride on the back roads. Okay. And driving down those roads and seeing the corn. There was some corn up. Maybe, maybe this is a little later. I'm not exactly sure about the field. But anyway, the, we were through, going through farm fields. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous day. And Helen started singing at the top of her lungs. <laughs> And she had a horrible voice. <laughs> and I started singing with her after she started, and I have a horrible voice. God bless America. <laughs> and she's moving her whole body to it. God bless America. And, of course, I was too. And she would be the only person I would feel comfortable enough to <laughs> say that in front of. She was just, it was delightful. It was a beautiful day. Yeah. And that... And, you know, she could be like that. I mean, very spontaneous and... Fun personality. Fun personality. And the beauty of the day, you know, her being captured by it and just reflecting that in her spirit. Yeah. So she was really... She was a proud American. She was a proud American. Yeah. She took the democracy stuff and she followed politics. There's a... She's talking about American politics on one of those tapes. And she followed politics, and she wrote to, you'll find two letters, and they're one, they're signed, I think they're original signatures from LBJ and um, Hubert Humphrey. Oh, wow. Uh, I think she, you know, was in touch with them. I think she's caught, she spoke on the phone to Hubert Humphrey with these Head Start grants. Oh, I mean, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, she... She took the democracy stuff very seriously, and, um, yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Uh, did Helen Bass Williams ever mention what um, she was the most proud of? Because she has a lot of accomplishments in mm-hmm. her life. She's mm-hmm. really, really involved in the civil rights movement and educating communities and yeah. students, but did she ever kind of say what she was I asked her about that and there's a quote in here somewhere and it's on the tape I've got her on tape and she says I've done this I've done that and And the one thing I know is that I was a damn hard worker and I'm so proud of it I can't you know can hardly stand it Mm -hmm. and she was yeah. And everything that she did, she put that thought, feeling, and action into it. And, um, and you know, she, uh, yeah, I don't know what her personal life was at that time in terms of a significant other or who her touchstones were and all that. She doesn't bring that up into it. She mainly tells about the people that are in the story or that, but that's just remarkable. Mm-hmm. You know, I, she was a lone wolf organizer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you did, so you did mention earlier and in your thesis that she experienced, like, so she was involved in the civil rights movement, but she experienced a lot of sexism during mm-hmm. her involvement, and she kind of so she worked, um, so she was a French teacher mm-hmm. um, at Tougaloo College. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but she, it sounded from when I was reading your thesis that she kind so she taught almost like on the side to help her, um, help pay for her, like her life so that she mm-hmm. could continue to be involved in community work because she realized that she wasn't going to be able to have any, have like a leadership position. In the, in within the, the con- civil, within the civil rights. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know if she would have thought of it like that. I think she thought of it more as these things are linked. 
this education and my organizing, okay. this, this works well for me getting out there and creating these free spaces where I have create possibilities for race advancement. Mm -hmm. And she just, I think, saw that strategically as a way, yeah, um, I can be independent, I have autonomy because I have my own money, mm -hmm. status, and I can do, I, this provides me with the avenues of doing okay. social change work. But no, I don't think as she was thinking about she, in terms of, you know, being a leader in any of these organizations. Oh, okay. No, that's not what she wanted to do. No, she liked no. the grassroots. She was she okay. no. Okay, she had her own authority and leadership that was you could just feel when she yeah. you were around her and okay. she didn't need more than that. Okay, she she she. I don't think she okay. did. Okay, yeah, great. Um, but um, the uh, patriarchy and sexism. Uh, starts out very uh, young for her. You'll see there's a group of stories uh, from her childhood. Is when my heart first opened. I, I call it that because I read her a quote that about, you know, it's from an existentialist who I knew she'd love. And, um, uh, and uh, that there's that people go through life and they seek to recapture that moment when their heart first opened. And so I said, Helen, you've been through, a, could you talk to me about when your, your heart first opened? And she quickly told three stories, beautifully. I mean, these aren't stop, go, stop. These are boom, 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 boom. Heart first opened to love, religion, and I forgot what the other one was. It's in there. It might be cruelty. Oh. Uh, but uh, the heart one is a, a story about her grandmother on her mother's side, who was in a mental institution and then lived with Helen and her mother. And she she had this thing where she would get completely dressed up and go to the outhouse and come in and then make all this mess with clothing and anyway there was a conflict between Helen's mother and her maybe it was her mother-in-law I'm not sure it was Helen's grandma and um and then Helen figured out that she wasn't so much off as she was lonely and how she started conveying that to her grandmother very openly mm -hmm. and how, you know, her, that's when her heart first opened to like the power of love when she had that encounter with her grandmother and how much her love meant and showing her love to her grandmother meant to her grandmother. Mm -hmm. um, the one on religion is a story of the prayer bench and of course that was part of a ritual in a lot of black churches where you, you know, they'd have these ceremonies and you were supposed to, you know, get the Holy Spirit and da 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 and the kids were at the prayer branch to get the Holy Spirit. What goes on for a couple of days for people to get the Holy Spirit and Helen's just not getting the Holy Spirit and her mother is really angry at her because she's the only one that's not dancing and mm -hmm. um, and so she talks about, you know, her getting the Holy Spirit, but she was not, and she what it felt like, but she was not going to let her mother or anybody else in the church know about it, because she very early noticed the hypocrisy of the church and how they dealt with women, okay, and that the young girls would get pregnant and they would be thrown out of the church, mm -hmm. but the boys had got them in trouble. There was no consequence. And then if the girls wanted to come back in with their children, they had to ask the congregation's forgiveness. And she found that just demoralizing. And she was not, I don't think, active in any churches on any kind of real basis. And then she also talks about black ministers coming on. To her. To her oh, and other women. Okay. Um, and, um, in fact, one of the stories that deals with MAP, and I finally caught on to it when I went through it, is... 
and I don't know how much this is related to her getting fired there or what, but there was a minister, a white minister, I believe, who somehow gets put in MAP, probably some powerful connection. And what he's doing is he's a skirt chaser. Okay. He's not doing his work. Um, and um, Helen's calling him on it, flat out. Yeah. Flat out. And he, I, I appear, I'm putting some of this, I'm projecting into it, but there's a long letter he writes about Helen's conduct. Okay. to a very official source and then you can see Helen must be responding to it and she puts together this file of letters from people about his sexism and what he'd done and that kind of thing. Yeah. I don't know eventually what happened but she saw that and um, you know she saw that uh, Martin Luther King and these folks they they did not have the women in, in uh, Ella Baker, I have a feeling, came across the same thing. She, Helen and I were big Ella Baker fans. Okay. She was the most socialist, overtly oh, okay. socialist, and Helen and I kind of shared those sensibilities. Um, um, and uh, that they uh, had kind of said, Let's, our men in front. They've, they've had enough, the men in front, and then the men were were sexist, you know, they didn't, they didn't include the women in there, mm -hmm. and so those women, in fact, um, one of the writers that I use says, the sexism of the men in the civil rights movement is, is responsible for creating a brilliant bridging segment by these women like Helen, that actually enables the civil rights movement, this mm -hmm. duality of things, okay. you know, it's, um, mm -hmm. oh, what's Marx's term for that, I forgot it, <clears throat> um, it's a dialectic, Okay. It's, it's, it's very dialectical, um, but Helen had a word for it in organizations, she called it the golden peepee -pee syndrome, <laughs> you had to watch out for that. Okay. <laughs> So she experienced that a lot in organizations that she was involved in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did she ever feel left out of anything because of it? Or did she mention it, I guess? She, she never mentioned about. anything like that. I mean, I would imagine she probably did, but I did not get a sense that she was a person that dwelt on stuff like that. Okay. Um, she would let it fly. Okay. I think she had a real consciousness about that notion of uh, things that are, it is what it is, okay. and let it go. Yeah. Move on. Okay. Okay, so you had a really strong personal relationship with mm -hmm. Helen, mm -hmm. and um, you had very, I guess, similar ideals, or... Mm -hmm ideas and morals and mm -hmm. um, almost like career paths as well. So how, how did knowing how, like Helen Williams affect your life? Mm -hmm. Like did it change anything? Did she like kind of inspire you yeah. to go into more um, like social I think social she inspired work? me more to be a better educator. Okay. Uh, and education is a form of organizing, really, because that's what I did when I got my PhD. I became a professor, and then I did all kinds of organizing projects with my students. Okay. On food pantries, on crime prevention through environmental design, through working with prisoners, that kind of stuff, restorative justice projects. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, she, in you know, very, we were very similar in that we saw educational institutions as a place where we could educate and create openings for people experiencing things that they hadn't experienced, particularly when it came to socioeconomic differences between people. Okay. So in that way, and, and she just made mobilizing come alive to me, really, in how... how 
you know, a sociologist has to teach about social structures. That's a hard thing for people to get a handle on. But if you understand what social structures you're embedded in, you can think better. Mm-hmm. You know, and you know, like, well, what are the values and practices of that, and what are the goals of that structure? Well, <clears throat> certainly, you see structures of things when you read these stories, and so I could use I use telling stories in my classes all the time, mm-hmm. and then I would go out and do speaking. I've done speaking. I haven't done that in a very long time. On, on Helen, um, kind of saturated this market, um, but my I'd have students. That will, you know, after they graduated, they became teachers. And you know, the, in fact, the last time I saw Helen, I was on my way to do a presentation. I believe it was in Murfreesboro, a Murfreesboro High School, at one of my students' classes about Helen and the Civil Rights Movement. And that was the last time I saw her. And she said, "Shake a tail, feller," and I did. I. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, that was the last time I saw her. And then here's an odd thing uh, about her death. I am not a person that is about ghosts or spirits or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I have had a few types of premonitions of dreams about certain things. Not very profound, but, you know, noteworthy. But the night Helen died... This is before I knew anything. I had the most incredible flying dream I have ever had. Now, have you ever had a dream where you're flying? Uh, I yes, and I usually kick myself away because then I feel like I'm falling. <laughs> oh, well, I wasn't falling in this. I was in free flight. Yeah. I could do it. I could jump up and fly, and Helen was with me. Oh. And we were flying over Southern Illinois. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, that's not typically my kind of dream. It felt really good. Yeah. It was a happy dream. Mm-hmm. Well, the next morning, the police officer comes to my door, mm-hmm. and somehow my phone had been out or something like that, and he said, we've been trying to reach you because your friend Helen has passed. And so, mm-hmm. But that was really, I, I you know, mm-hmm. I experienced her passing. Yeah. And the flying thing was like, wow, let it fly. Crazy. Yeah. Supposedly she had a pilot's license as well. A pilot's license? Yes. Really? I found no documentation of that in the things, but she said she flew. Oh, wow. Such an interesting person. <laughs> so many interests. Yeah, um, she really just, she really did. Yeah, yeah. so active. And like everything that she did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So is there I've finished all my questions. Is there anything else that you wanna add or anything that I've missed that you wanna talk about? Mm. Well, I don't know how any how your people will use these things, but there's a lot of possible research. Mm-hmm. things in here about the Head Start movement and Purdue's relationship to it. Yeah. Uh, you could do a whole number of things with the number nine. Mm-hmm. Somebody who was really interested in the Head Start movement in terms of conflicts within the movement and that kind of thing, that's, that's there. There's also some poetry written in there that people wrote poems to her. Okay. And some of them are done by people who I think are still alive, and, and I think one person in particular... Uh, became a major kind of player in the civil rights movement. But they were young people. Mm-hmm. She really got a big response from young people. So those poems are are in there. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah. I know she went through a lot um, at some points in her life with uh, depression. Okay. She did experience electric shock treatment for depression. Oh. I think this was at the same time that the there was the hatchet breakup. I think this is how I, I I'm putting this together. Being what's for, sorry, what's the hatchet, the hatchet breakup? breakup with um, my hatchet son oh, that owned the yeah. okay. the road thing. Um. And so uh, I know she dealt with you know issues of depression, but. 
it just didn't seem to hold her back. I think she just got, she was able to get energy from possibility. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I wish I had that ability. <laughs> yeah. 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 She was more optimistic. Um, yeah, we miss her. There's a whole, I mean, she mentored a lot of um, people down here, and mm-hmm. um, we, we miss her. Now some of those folks are gone. But. Okay, so you're still in touch with some of them? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from SCAM, Southern Counties Action Movement, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm very good friends with Mary Kay Bachman Banker and Steve Banker, and they're the ones that brought her to SCAM and started the whole connection with Number 9. Okay. So they're still around. Um, Max Odd, who's featured in him with some of his quotes, he loved Helen and so admired her, and he would stop in and visit, and mm-hmm. he was really saddened by her loss, but he's gone now. Mm. Um and then those folks in number nine um, that are still there. Um, um, I can't think this might have been coming in from golf. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, it's been interesting going back through here and, and regrets. You can't help but have them when you uh, start to see other little pieces that you just wonder about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, it'll be, it'll be a great collection to have at Purdue, and I think it'll get a lot of really great use by researchers. Good. Because it is really an absence that we yeah. have. Right now. Um, the other thing I want to remember to do, and I, I was um, want to make sure you have it, is H- Helen gave me a lot of stuff. Um, but one of the things she gave me was the actual award from Purdue. Oh, The gold great. medallion and oh, chain, okay. and I still have that. Okay. So I, you know, I have no need for that. So that I want to give that back as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. And I wanted to say, too, that I left this out here, this working in southern Illinois uh, that was a Smithsonian thing that I worked on with Carbondale Community Arts. And what I developed, and it's all in those little pieces, I don't know if you'd want it, and I can show you pictures of it, but it's, it's a, it was a big thing that the museum made up based on artifacts I gave them of a black coal miner's life, and oh, particularly okay. her father. So it, it, it focuses on Homer Kelly as a black coal miner oh, in Southern okay. Illinois. You know, I have his last pay envelope. Oh, Helen wow. had saved that, That's and I so figured sweet. it out from the date yeah. on it. But it shows you how they were paid and what things yeah. were taken out. And then also his, you know, when he was killed in the mining accident, picture of his family. He's a very handsome man. He looks Spanish. Okay. But his father, I guess, was, a, Helen said, a white Irishman that uh-huh. headed back to the potato famine. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's how she characterized it. Okay. But, um, yeah, he was prettiest. And, and, you know, she says about him, he read Kant. Her parents were both readers and educated. Uh-huh. They believed in education. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Great. Tom, this is Katie. I'm just going to pause the Oops. oral history. <laughs> Okay, so we're back. Um, so, Mary, is there anything else that you want to add to the oral history about Holland Bass Williams and your relationship with her? Mm. Well, I sure miss her. I would love to be able to talk to her and wonder what she would think about the times we're in now and yeah. our president and our, our leadership. Uh, political leadership um, and to have her uh, ideas on the various women that are running for yeah really exciting office. times yeah yeah 
she she has informed me so much about you know her life about black history and the complexities of it and uh, you know there's no simple way of understanding things I, I watched the the first debates and um, when, awesome. yeah when um, do you need anything from the store no sorry um, when Biden and um, Harris get into it about the busing thing and mm -hmm. she goes and you know you were for busing and that kind of thing and yeah the reality of it is that blacks were deeply torn about busing mm -hmm. and that black teachers were really torn about busing Helen amongst them and what they wanted was more e funding for their schools that they could be equal to the white schools mm -hmm. they didn't necessarily because they felt and it did happen that their kids would go into white schools and they would no longer have a newspaper or, you know, be the cheerleaders or what. And that did happen. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I listen to things differently. I know that there are divisions within group and misrepresentations of mm -hmm. history and, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Well, thank mm -hmm. you so much for... Mm -hmm speaking with me yeah. and for telling me about your relationship with Helen Bass Williams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it seemed really special. Yeah, it was. I was, I was graced by it. At one time, I brought um, my mother to visit Helen. Oh, wow. Now, my mother was very disengaged from my whole educational process. She didn't know what I was going to graduate. So she just, they wanted, you know, they thought, be a court reporter, you'll meet a lawyer and marry was their sensibilities or my mother's sensibilities about, you know, so she just never got it. But it was a really, Helen was so charming and nice to her. And plus my mother is, 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 is bigoted, absolutely. Oh. Um, she doesn't have, she hasn't had contact with black people. She lives in Bridgeport and Cicero, you know, they're two notoriously uh, white or racist neighborhoods. And, um, it was just a very, I had a very strange, strange feeling having those two presences in my life at the same time. Mm -hmm. One that was so affirming to me and one that was very like dismissive. That. Yeah. You know, and you know, thinking about what mothers do. <laughs> and, you know, that was a very strange hmm. feeling, I remember. Yeah. Well, thank you so much.